Hi everybody, today we are going to be looking at a bunch of terms that you've probably heard before, but um, we're going to explain it in more depth and kind of in their relationship to cancer. Uh, so you're looking at them right now, um, just go ahead and we're going to go ahead and pronounce them, just be, it, it's important. Um, kinase phosphatase receptor, secondary messenger, GPCR, cyclin CDK, hormone, nuclear receptors, transcription factors, mitochondria aerobic respiration, anaerobic respiration, cell cycle, G, S, G2, my, oops, that's supposed to say mitosis, cytokinesis, lamins, microtubules, mTOC, and nuclear envelope. All right, so um, the first thing I'd like you to do is admire this beautiful slide construction. And if you'll see on the left, you have your vocab terms um, with a small red square around them. And as I talk, hopefully, what I'm talking about will correspond to the thing in the red square. That hopefully made sense. Okay, so kinase and phosphatase. Um, there is a tiny, tiny little molecule called a phosphate group, and it's hugely important in cancer and all biology, actually. It is a heavily neg negatively charged um, molecule, and so if you try to put two of them together, it takes a lot of energy, but also if you take this negatively charged molecule and you put it on anything else, it will generally change the shape of it. Uh, so there are two types of enzymes, and because they're enzymes, they're proteins, um, kinases and phosphatases, which go ahead and add and then detract or subtract or remove dephosphatases size the molecules, uh, and they are respectively called the kinase and the phosphatase. So Kinases, as you can see here, are going to add a protein, or a phosphate, sorry, to a protein. So this is a phosphorylated protein, and the phosphatase is going to remove the phosphate group from the protein, and you will generally be left with an OH group where the phosphate group was. Um, kinases often are abbreviated, so anytime you see a biological enzyme or protein or anything basically that ends in the letter K, map K, um, for example, uh, you're generally going to be talking about a phosphatase, sorry, kinase, and phosphatases are different. They're called all kinds of different things. They don't often end with the letter P, so they're sneaky. Um, all right, so here's an example of a enzyme that is phosphorylated and dephosphorylated um, and its relationship to cancer. So you guys have probably heard of mitosis. Well, this is the mitosis promoting factor, sometimes called the MPF or the um, MCDK. Um, so this is an enzyme right here. It's got two pieces. And in order for this enzyme to work, um, it has to be de-inhibited and activated. So on this protein, there are two parts, or two kind of important regulatory regions. One is an inhibitory region, and one is an activating region. So if this inhibitory region is phosphorylated, then this whole thing will not work. Um, if this activating region is not phosphorylated, then it also will not work. So if you're kind of thinking about this in terms of coding, you need a no inhibitory signal and a yes activating signal in order for this to work. Um, so there is an activating phosphatase that will actually go ahead and remove this inhibitory phosphate uh, and activate this whole thing. I think that phosphatase's name is we one but don't. <laughs> we one W-E-E-1. -E That's kind of funny. Uh, anyway, yeah. All right. Receptors. Okay, so there are many kinds of receptors. The receptors you might want to think of as the thing on a cell that allows a cell to become responsive. So if you think about a cell in an environment, there's just tons of things that it's coming in contact with all the time. Um, glucose, water, salt, uh, light, um, sound, um, and hormones, estrogens, testosterone, insulin, leptin, um, all kinds of things. And cells are only going to be sensitive sensitive to things that they have receptors for. Uh, so a receptor is a protein generally in the cell membrane that allows the cell to become sensitive to a specific signal. So there are many different types of receptors. Um, there's the transporter, and that's going to be where kind of I think what most people think of receptor, and that's where something comes in 
uh, either binds to a channel and lets something in or just comes in itself. Um, and there's going to be a uh, enzyme-linked receptor, um, a GPCR, and these kind of two over here, which are which are slightly stranger. Um, so these receptors actually allow the cell to bind to other things. So this receptor is allowing the cell to bind to another cell. It's going to be super important in ideas like metastasis. So in order for a cell to be able to split off and go away, it's got to become unsticky. Um, and if you want to form a tumor, you have to make a sticky cell. Uh, this cell receptor is actually attached to a matrix um, that is going to serve as kind of a protective and structural element around the cell. Um, and then you have these kind of different paradigms of receptors here where you get kind of a secondary messenger. So the GPCR uh, will activate some kind of secondary messenger after a ligand binds to the top of it on the outside and that will generally start a signal cascade. Um, sometimes you can have that so GPCRs are G protein coupled receptors. So it's the G protein G protein coupled part that is going to do the activating. In an enzyme linked receptor, it's going to be the receptor itself which is going to generally phosphorylate or dephosphorylate something. Um, all right. Uh, this is a closer look at the secondary messenger system that is used in the paradigm of GPCRs. So again, G protein coupled receptors. Um, you'll see this motif a lot. It's basically something binds to the outside of a cell. It does not come inside of the cell. The receptor changes in shape slightly, causing this thing to switch out a GDP for a GTP. Um, and then that protein goes and acts as a secondary messenger to another protein um, which will then activate some kind of pathway. So GPCRs uh, allow a cell to become sensitive to one thing and then hook into another system. So here is the thing it's going to be sensitive to, this purple dot here, um, and here is going to be what the system hooks into. So the receptor, the ligand, the thing that goes into the receptor, never actually activates this secondary system. There's an intermediate system that activates, that connects this thing, this signal, to the secondary system. Um, here is a pretty animation of kind of what a receptor looks like inside of a cell. This is a dimeric receptor, so that means it's got two parts. Uh, and it will receive something from the outside of the cell and uh, change shape and generally signal something on the inside of the cell. All right. Now we got cyclins and CDKs. Cyclins and CDKs are not that complicated. Um, CDK, as we talked about before, stands, stands for cyclin-dependent kinase. So we know that the kinase is going to act... Oh, man, I hate it when I get prank calls. Um, anyway, <clears throat> cyclin-dependent kinases. So they are going to phosphorylate... Um, generally multiple targets. So you can see here we have a CDK. Uh, it is inactive. Uh, it forms its active site, so this is an enzyme, and the active site is formed when the cyclin, the thing that the cyclin-dependent kinase is dependent on, comes and binds to the CDK. Um, so generally you'll have, a lot of times you'll have the CDK built and in the cell, and then the cell will build these cyclins only when they want the CDK to be activated, or sorry, only when it's beneficial to the cell to have the CDK activated. Um, that CDK will then go ahead and phosphorylate usually multiple targets. In this case, it is going to be the S cyclin CDK complex, which means we're going to start replication. Um, here, we looked at the M cyclin CDK complex, which is going to be responsible for starting mitosis. And you're going to see this over and over again where you're going to have a cyclin and CDK complex responsible for starting some aspect of the cell cycle, which we're going to talk about later. Okay, so this is what the actual cyclin CDK complex looks like. Here you have the CDK, here you have the cyclin, and you can see together they're kind of forming this active site. 
yeah. Right. So another kind of signal that we're going to talk about is the nuclear receptor. And the nuclear receptor is a little bit different than hormones or receptors that we've looked at in the past. So estrogen is a very good example. So you see you have estrogen here. And estrogen can actually bypass the cell membrane. It is small and nonpolar. And it will bind to an estrogen receptor. And then that estrogen receptor will, when bound to estrogen, go directly to DNA and affect transcription. So this is kind of what the estrogen receptor looks like when it's bound to DNA. So you can see the estrogen here in light purple, and I believe this is dark purple, maybe blue, I don't know. Uh, but this is the estrogen receptor, and this is estrogen itself. Now the difference between an estrogen receptor, sorry, a nuclear receptor and the original receptor is that a nuclear receptor is going to bind to basically something that comes into the cell, whereas a regular receptor is going to bind to something that doesn't come into the cell uh, and binds on the outside of the cell. And estrogen receptor, sorry, nuclear receptors generally travel directly to DNA and affect uh, transcription. Um, so this is the binding site between an estrogen, or sorry, a nuclear receptor and uh, DNA. This is specifically the estrogen receptor, which we just looked at. And the part of the protein that binds to DNA is called a zinc finger. Um, and zinc fingers are part of proteins that are specific to sequences of DNA. You just take um, two or three zinc fingers, you put them together, and basically they will bind to a section of DNA that's pretty unique. So... This is kind of cool because it's an idea that you're going to come across a lot from now on, that proteins here can bind specifically to a sequence of DNA here. And it's kind of cool because the protein is actually not pulling apart the DNA and like reading the T's, A's, and G's, and C's. It's kind of looking at this open face of DNA, and uh, it is able to read the sequence through there.